All right, y'all ready for this? All right, here we go. It's so good to be with you guys this morning. Um, we've had a couple of weeks off and we've done some other stuff, uh, but I want to kind of refresh your mind to where we were about two weeks ago. We were doing a sermon series called Push Through It. It's basically pray until something happens. And prayer is really one of the most underutilized tools in our spiritual toolbox but the truth is prayer is kind of like the electrical wire it's the conduit that god releases blessing into your life chris it's how god releases uh favor into your life and promise i mean it's just how it happens and um, prayer is how you build your church how you build your family how you build your career it has to be there uh and we'll probably say we all have faith okay but when we can add prayer to our faith, it kind of supercharges it, kind of puts it on roids a little bit. Sort of like a, uh, like a laser beam. A laser beam is just one layer of, uh, I'm sorry, it's several layers of light all going in the same direction. Uh, I've never seen a flashlight cut a car in half before. I've seen laser beams cut cars in half before. And that's because of this, they're both light beams, but that laser, it's stacked on top of each other and they all go in the same direction and it's powerful. Y'all, when we add prayer to our faith, you're tapping into the laser power of God, if you will. Just to make it simple, I know it sounds corny, but it's just the way I can understand it. It really, it really pumps things up in your life. Uh, prayer is the way that we lay hold of those promises and those blessings that God has for us. The Bible is a book that's full of promises for us about our health, our family, our finances, how we live, over 3,000 of them. And the Bible says every one of them for you in Christ is yes, it's yours, it belongs to you. Praise the Lord. I, I, want you to, I want you to know those promises. The way you know them is that you read them in the Bible, but the way that you really make them your own is that you pray them. Okay, I, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leave me beside the still waters. Lord, you're my good shepherd. You lead me beside the waters in my life that I don't like to look at. They're horrible. Either they stink or they're dangerous. Lord, lead me through that. Heal my soul because I'm blistered on my heart. I'm broken. I'm torn. But Lord, I know that you lead me and you guide me. You're, you, you, you protect me. You can make those promises yours. They belong to you. And when you can do that, guys, you will see a difference in your prayer life and in your relationship with God. In previous message, we looked at a guy by the name of Jacob. Uh, he had a brother named Esau. It was a really cool story. If you haven't seen those messages, you can get them on Spotify or YouTube or whatever. Uh, but we found that Jacob was this guy who, uh, he was blessed by God. And he had a blessing that God had given him. But what we found out is that the only way Jacob got that blessing, received it, uh, redeemed the voucher, if you will, is that he had to wrestle with God all night long. The blessing was him, but God wanted him to wrestle him for it. And it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And then I thought as, as a parent... Uh, I remember doing crazy stuff like that all the time, you know. I was going to give it to the kid, but I want them to work for it. I want them to want it. I want them to go through the hoops to get it. And it still doesn't make me a bad parent, but I wanted to show people. I wanted to show the kids that's, you know, that's, that's okay. That's how you do it. Yo, know, when we're talking about the promises of God and we're talking about what Jacob did, Jacob, uh, Jacob had tried to manipulate God to give something that God had already given him. That's what he was trying to do. It was something that God had declared for him, but Jacob only took it. But only J uh, Jacob only took possession of it after a night of wrestling with God. You ever wrestled with God all night long? Yeah. Well, you walk away different. In fact, Jacob walked away with a limp on his hip, but he pushed through and he won the blessing. Today, we're going to take another look at. We're going to take a look at da Daniel. Daniel was uh, an Old Testament prophet, and you're going to you're going to hear the whole story of Daniel. It's a cool story. But there are three points that I see, insights, if you will, three insights to how Daniel's prayer was kind of off the chart. It was off the chain when you look at him. He had a disciplined prayer life. He had a defiant prayer life. And he had a prayer life that endured. And so, just so you know, you're only going to get one of those points today. I want to get to the other two next week. But you're going to hear the story of Daniel today. If you have your copy of God's Word, I want to ask you to turn to Daniel chapter 6. That's where we're going to be at. So if you need a minute to find that... Uh, That'd be cool. If not, the words will be up on the screen. Uh, but we're going to be in Daniel 6 just to give you a chance to look up. Daniel. Let's talk about Dan. Dan was an Israelite. means he was a Jew. He lived in, uh, he lived in Israel, primarily Jerusalem. Uh, and he was a good kid, smart kid, 12, 13, 14 years old. That's what scholars tell us that he was whenever we, we kind of pick up his story. Uh, Daniel had, had been there and, and probably somewhere in middle school. And God had been telling Israel... 
uh, y'all are messing up. You're not faithful. You don't love me. You, you don't do the things I ask you to do. And if you don't straighten up, I'm going to bring the... I'm going to bring the smack down on you. And that's really what happened. Over years and years and years, Israel didn't listen to God's call to repent. He didn't, he didn't, uh, they didn't listen. And so God made up, uh, God made good on his promise. He said, if you don't get it right, I'm going to put the smack down on you. And that's what he did. In 586 BC, there was this, this bad mamma jamma of, of a king. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. He, he, uh, he, 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 he ruled over, over Babylon. Big deal. Uh, he goes into Israel in, in 586 B.C. He goes into Jerusalem. That's where the first temple was destroyed. And when Nebuchadnezzar came in there, they killed, they slaughtered thousands of people, okay? And the people that they didn't slaughter, they put in cages and took back to Babylon. Okay, that happens. Imagine being about 12, 13, 14 years old and an army comes into Chester or Rockwood or wherever you live. This opposing army comes in and your mom and dad are killed in front of you. That's Dan. Maybe his sister was raped in front of him. That's Dan. He saw all this. And after maybe he saw his mom and dad killed, and maybe after he saw his sister brutalized, they took him into a cage on the back of a wagon like on Planet of the Apes, and they haul him all the way to Babylon. He's a slave now. He's a servant now. He's underneath their authority. Like I said, Dan's a sharp guy. He's smart. And on top of him just being naturally smart, God gave him a spirit that just kind of made him awesome. Daniel was a type of guy that good think, I guess other than seeing your parents killed and your sister, uh, Daniel was a guy that God had favor on. God had a blessing for. And when he got hauled off down there to Babylon, uh, even, even Nebuchadnezzar and the people in the government said, man, there's something, there's something different about this old Dan, this old Dan kid. So Daniel was probably about 12, 13 years old. Uh, and after he got there, Daniel was selected to be a part of, a, of an internship program. He was called to be a part of an internship program, and, and the king called 120 young people because these are the people that he's going to let kind of run his government, make sure that these people keep, uh, make sure these people keep all the other people in line. Uh, they were sort of like henchmen in a way. In fact, if you go to Webster's Dictionary, I'm going to show you a word here in a second in text, and you'll say, well, I've never seen that word. It just means they worked for the government, and they, were, they could have been shady. They could have been shady. But he got picked to do this. And the reason why they would pick an Israelite to do this is because uh, if they could get an Israelite to come in who would worship Nebuchadnezzar, get a hold of the government, uh, and, and, and adhere to the Babylonian law, man, if you have an Israelite who's drank the Kool-Aid, he can go back to the Isra other Israelites and kind of win them in. And they were hoping to kind of do an MK Ultra thing on Daniel, okay? Kind of bring him into their way, brainwash him a little bit. Well, that's going to be kind of hard to do with Daniel. You're going to see that in just a minute. He's a part of this internship. And uh, our boy Dan gets picked, and God blessed him. And old Daniel distinguished himself among them 120 other dudes. Here's what happened. As they're going through this internship program, they come up with this rule that says, well, if you're going to be in this program, you've got to eat what we want you to eat. You've got to exercise the way we want you to exercise. You need to do all these things the way we tell you to do. Now, that, you know, that's fine, unless... They want Daniel to eat pork. He can't do that as a Jew. They've got kosher laws, so they, they don't eat, you know, they don't eat barbecue. So uh, Daniel says, well, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's not who I am. And so he, he, he tells his boss that, and the boss says, hey, dude, if you eat this, you're going to be sharper, you're going to be more physically fit, you're going to be able to run further, blah, 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 blah. And Daniel said, I'm not doing it. And the old boy said, mm, you got two options. You either eat or we're going to execute you. What you want to do? Daniel says, I'll tell you what, let's make a deal. Let me do my thing for 10 days, the way my Lord wants me to, the way my God wants me to, the way Yahweh wants me to do. I'm going to eat my diet. I'm going to exercise the way I, I, the way I see fit. And at the end of 10 days, you take your boys and me, and let's see who's smarter. Let's see who's sharper. Let's see who looks better. 10 days go by. You know what happens. Of course, maybe you can guess what happens. Daniel comes out looking like Tom Selleck, okay? This dude's just sharp. He's handsome. He's, he's focused, laser-focused. And, 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 and you know, kind of won the bet, if you will. If it, it proved that, yeah, it was right. But what I want you to see more than that is that Daniel wouldn't go along with the crowd. He went with his commands that he got from God. God gave him the ability to know some really cool stuff. 
Daniel 2 says that God gave Daniel an incredible amount of wisdom, an incredible amount of skill, and a, an incredible amount of intelligence. This is what I think. I think Daniel was good at math. I think he was good at science. I think Daniel was good at physics. I think Daniel was good at astronomy. He could tell you where all the constellations were and all that stuff. He was sharp. And you add on top of that God's blessing and favor. I got a feeling that if you had a question back in the old days and you couldn't go to Google, you couldn't go to Google, you went to Dan. Because Dan was a man. He was sharp and he, uh, he, he knew it all. Fam, uh, finally, Daniel 6.3. This is where I kind of want you to be. Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and the satraps. That satraps word, that's the henchmen. That's the interns. That's the 120 interns. How many of y'all used the word satrap in the last two years in any of your sentences? No, absolutely not. But that's what it means. It's somebody who's serving that internship with the government. That's what, that's what I was referring to. Because Dan had an extraordinary spirit, so the king planned to set him over the whole realm. Which I guess kind of takes the mean that everybody liked Dan. He was smart. Uh, so let's pick that up. Chapter 6. This is where we're going to start the story. It pleased Darius. Y'all say Darius. This isn't the lead singer of, of Hooting the Blowfish. This is, uh, Darius uh, was the guy who took over for Nebuchadnezzar after Nebuchadnezzar died, all right? So Darius is a new king. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 what? Interns. Can we go with that word? All right. 120 interns to be over the whole kingdom and over, uh, and over these. So there's 120 interns working for the Babylonian government. Henchmen, if you will. Three governors were picked from these 120 people, of which, who got the job? Okay, dudes, there's 120 people in this internship program. Daniel is in the top three of his class. Sharp dude. Smart guy. Three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the interns might give account to them. So you got 117 interns reporting to three governors. And their whole job is to make sure that everybody in the kingdom follows Darius. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the interns because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought, Darius gave thought to, hey, I'm going to give this guy, the, he's going to be my secretary of state. Okay, that's what he was thinking. So the governors and the interns who grew up in Babylon, who ain't been nowhere else, we got to get this sucker out of here. He's taking our jobs. He's here illegally. Mm, that sounds contemporary, doesn't it? Why is he in charge? So the governors and the interns sought to find some charge against Odan concerning the kingdom. But they couldn't find anything wrong with him. No fault. Because he was faithful to who? To his God, Yahweh. This dude wouldn't even eat pork chop. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. I want to break that down for you because this is crazy. The only thing they could find out about Daniel, the only thing they knew about him is that he loved God and he followed God. Wouldn't that be crazy if the only bad thing people could find out about you is that, they lo that you love God? Man, if that's the worst thing you have in your life, that you love God, gold star. But that was this dude. Everybody knew who he, who he loved. Everybody knew who he worshipped. Everybody knew where he stood. Verse 6. So these governors and interns, they thronged before the king, and they said thus to him, King Darius, you're so handsome. You're so smart. Everybody loves you. You make all the right decisions. We hope you live forever. Man, can you imagine what that would have done to that dude's ego? <coughs> Shameless flattery. Verse 7. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the interns, the counselors, the advisors, anybody who got a paycheck from the government, they got together and they conspired, having consulted together to establish a royal law to make a firm decree that whoever worships or petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, King Darius, we just told you how stinking awesome you are, for 30 days, let's have a decree that if anybody worships something other than you, we kill him, we execute him. Wouldn't that be great? 
Wouldn't that be super Darius? And, the, and this is what happens. Now, in verse 8, O king, establish this decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which do not alter. This is what that means. Even if after the king signed this law, this, this statute, this edict, even if King Darius would change his mind in the Medo-Persian law, even if the king changed his mind, he couldn't change it. It's sort of like a double top secret, super pinky promise type of thing, okay? So whenever that was done, it's done. Even if Darius realized, oh man, I didn't know I was going to kill Dan. He couldn't change his mind. That was the law. They tricked him. I'm going to tell you what happened. This is what Darius did. He listened to flattery. He started reading the paper and started believing it about him. You know how awesome he was. So he got some bad advice because these people kind of stroked his ego. Should have ever done what he did, but he did because he listened to the flattery of others. Therefore, King Darius signed the written, verse 9, Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. I love this next part. This is, to me, this is the money shot. Now, when Daniel knew that the ink was dry on the paper, he didn't get scared. He went home. What did he do there? Check this out. He went to his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees. How many times a day? Probably eight, three times a day. So I'd probably say that's the way he did it. Morning, evening, uh, morning, afternoon, and evening. And he prayed and he gave thanks to God as was his custom since when? Back when he was in Jerusalem, the place where he saw his mom and dad killed and his sister brutalized. He's been doing this his whole life. This is how he rolled. This is who he was. Daniel didn't get his marching orders. Here's the thing. Daniel didn't get his marching orders from the king. He didn't get them from any governor. He didn't get them from any other intern or counselor or anybody else in the government. He didn't get his marching orders from Twitter or political correctness or, 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 or school officials or governmental officials. He said, the drummer that I'm marching to is God. No matter what they say or what you say, I'm marching to the beat of the Lord's drum. He got his marching orders from God, which to me was probably the way, that was the secret to his success. I think that's why the guy was, um, was top shelf. Y'all, when you tried, this is going to resonate with us, because it, re, it's gonna, it resonates with me. You are going to be so disappointed when you try to please everybody in your life. You can't. You're going to live... You're going to live frustrated and discouraged and disappointed if you try to please everybody. Let me, can I make this easy for us? What if, what if we lived our life not to please an, an audience, but what if we tried to live our life for an audience of one? I just want to love you. I want to do what you tell me to do. And everything else doesn't matter. That's what Dan did. He said, Lord, I know what the world's saying. I know what the government's saying. I know what the king's saying. But what I want to know is what you have to say. When we try to please everyone else, that's where things go wrong. I'll, I'm going to show you three insights to the kind of praying that Daniel did. Again, you're only going to get one point. I'm just letting you know what's going to happen next week, maybe. The first thing I want to show you about Dan's prayer. He, Dan had a disciplined prayer life. It was, it was regimented. All right, and that doesn't mean it's weak or it was rote or it didn't make any difference because apparently his prayer life made a difference in his life. All right, uh, Dan, uh, the story tells us that old Dan prayed routinely three times a day, and I, I, I'm going to make the case that this was really the primary source of his strength. And this is what I this is how I kind of get that. How many times do you eat a day? How many? How many of you graze all day long? Praise the Lord. Amen. They're my people. My people. Daniel ate three times a day. So he could maintain his strength. So he could maintain his health. So he could stay cognitively sharp and all that good stuff. So I think when he, you know, when he was eating three times a day for the strength of his body, I would probably say that that might have been a good time that he would take some time to pray. Because he knew that the food sustained his body, but he also knew that God sustained his spirit. So I, I think that three times a day is, a, is an issue because he understood where his strength came from. And, and I think that's why he met with God as often as he did. You know, the most important discipline we can have in meeting with God every day, uh, for those who don't have a daily time with God, let me ask you a question. How do you make it in your family without daily quiet time with God? 
How do you make it at your work? How do you make it at school? If you are not spending time with God on the reg on a daily basis, I don't know how you make it. Prayer is how God releases His wisdom to you, His promise and His word. It's through prayer that you get all that stuff from there to here. And that takes discipline. Man, you look at Jesus' ministry. Y'all, he stayed up all night praying before he called his disciples. If Jesus had to stay up all night praying to get, to get some, some information on the decision, what do you think that says about you and me? What should our effort look like? What should our prayer life look like if that's what Jesus did? Prayer is how God releases that into our lives the night before Jesus died. Jesus took three of his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They went into, the, I'm, this is kind of the other side of the story. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, deep, deep, deep into the Garden of Gethsemane. And so nobody would bother him. He gets there with Peter, James, and John. This is what he says. He says, y'all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there to the road. I want you guys to stay here, and I want you to stay awake, and I want you to pray. I want you to watch and pray. Pray that you don't fall into temptation, because I know that the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Those are the words he says. He leaves him. He goes a little bit further. I, I want to show you that text up on the screen. Matthew 26, 41. He says, watch and pray, least you enter into what? It's kind of an odd, it, it, it's odd, but it's very specific. He said, pray that you don't fall into temptation. Well, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. What are they going to be tempted about? We'll come back to that. Jesus goes out, prays, he comes back. All three of them mugs are sleeping. Now you know what they did. Jesus rolls up to them. <laughs> oh, and Jesus blessed the missionaries in Jesus' name. Amen. He was try- I'd probably say there might have been a couple of them mugs trying to fool him. But when Jesus rolled up there, he said, Guys, couldn't you just stay awake for a little while to pray? What are they praying for? Watch so that you're... Don't enter into temptation. So that you don't enter into temptation. Still odd. Still hits me weird. It slaps different. Why would Jesus ask them to pray not to be led into temptation? Let's fast forward the evening. They've hauled Jesus from kangaroo court to kangaroo court to kangaroo court. From Caiaphas to King Agrippa to King Herod to Pilate, blah, blah, blah. They're out in the courtyard. There's fires everywhere. It's dark. And old Pete's kind of following Jesus from a distance. They, you know, Peter loves Jesus. One little girl comes up to him and says, Hey, don't, aren't you one of his guys? And Pete says, Dude, you're crazy. I don't even know this man. A couple minutes later go by. Man, you sure sound like one of them Galileans. Are you sure you're not with him? I'm telling you, I don't know the dang guy. And he uses a, you know, a, a, a profanity. He says, I don't know him. That happens a third time, and Jesus has already said, dude, before the night, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. Three times. Last time, Peter says, no, I don't know him. I want you to watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. When Peter was out there in that courtyard... I think that was the temptation. Because the temptation was to say, I'm with him. The temptation was to do what Peter did. The right move would to say, yep, that's my Lord. That's my Savior. That's my King. That's my Messiah. So I think the reason why Jesus was saying, guys, you need to pray that you don't fall into temptation because the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What if? What if? When we pray, that's how God gives us the strength to overcome the world. To overcome that next temptation. To stay on the Lord's side when the world's screaming, come to our side. What if prayer is the secret to staying on the path and saying the right things and doing the right things? What if that whole Garden of Gethsemane prayer request was so Peter wouldn't have made the biggest mistake of his life? So he wouldn't have made the biggest blunder of his life. I guarantee you. I would think that Peter thought about that night for the rest of his life. 
No matter how much you love God, I remember when I let you down. I think that's why Jesus told those guys to pray in a very specific way. It's because the prayers is what gives us the power to say no or yes. There was a book called The Circle Maker Book. It talks about on July 16th of 1969, there were three astronauts landed on the two astronauts landed on the moon. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and uh, Michael Collins. Buzz Aldrin uh, and those guys, they propelled into space aboard Apollo 11. The rocket itself, I say only, it weighed uh, 107,000 7, pounds. That's big. But when you hear about the rockets, the rocket apparatus weighed, uh, 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 it carried 5.6 million pounds of fuel. Can you imagine what that would have cost? 5.6 million pounds of fuel. And at takeoff, the five engines produced seven and a half million pounds of thrust because that's what it took for, for that rocket to reach 17,500 miles an hour in order for it to break free of the gravitational pull of the earth. That's a lot! Prayer. Prayer is what you need to get past the gravitational pull of this earth to reach God. That's the only way you'll do it. That's the only way it's pulled off. It's through prayer. It's how you break free of this gravitational pull of the earth's orbit so you can get into the orbit of God. Now, how does that happen, Mike? Well, I'm not telling you you have to pray seven times, I'm sorry, three times a day. Maybe that's not the way it works. Uh, but let's start with that because that's what, the, what's, that's what I got to work with, okay? What would happen if you prayed three times a day? And you say, well, Brother Mike, I pray to God all the time. Okay. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. But I'm talking more than just those two-second prayers. How much, time do you set a t how much time do you set apart each day just to pray? How much time do you set apart a day to just be with God? And here's the thing. You need to, uh, we need, we need to set a time. We must set a time as we look at a prayer discipline. Let me show you a cool ending to the end of that story with Buzz and Mike and, and Neil. Um, for those of us who remember, we're old enough to see some video of it. And on Apollo 8, when they were looking back over the earth and look at the moon, uh, they started reading Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You remember seeing that video? NASA got sued by, AC, by the ACLU. Did you know that? NASA got sued by the ACLU for that being broadcast. So in 1969, when Apollo 11 lands on the moon, it just so happens that Buzz Aldrin was an elder in the Presbyterian Church. When they landed, they served communion on the moon. Did you know that? They blocked it out. They wouldn't show it. But when Buzz was, was serving him and, and Neil Armstrong... This communion, which, by the way, the gravitational pull on the moon is one-sixth of what it is uh, as strong on the earth. So he said the wine curled up on the side of the cup. And this is what Buzz read. He, he read John 15, 5. This was the verse. You didn't hear it on TV. But he said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from Jesus, you can't do anything. Can you imagine doing that on the moon? Apart from me, you can't do anything. Miss Pam, would you come up, honey? The question I have is, why would I be preaching about prayer? Why is prayer so important? Why is it a big deal? Because... Apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. Apart from Him, we can't do anything. Nothing of any lasting value, nothing of any spiritual value. Apart from Him, we can't do squat. So why pray? Because apart from me, you can do nothing. How many times a day do you pray? Psalm 127 verse 1 says this. 
Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. You see that? Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, they labor in vain. Now, that verse means so much more than what we read on face value. Let me put it in a way so maybe you and I can get this. Unless the Lord builds the marriage, whatever you do is in vain. Unless the Lord builds your church, whatever you do is in vain. Unless the Lord builds your relationships, whatever you do is in vain. Unless the Lord builds your mind, your sobriety, everything you do in vain. Guys, we need Jesus. We need Him. It's the most, prayer is the most underutilized tool in our box. It opens up blessing. It opens up promise. It opens up hope. It gives us an opportunity for peace and healing. We can't do anything without Him. How many times a day you pray? I mean pray. Not just for your Rice Krispies. Not just for your French fries and your Happy Meal. When's the last time you prayed for your marriage? Three minutes. When's the last time you prayed for your kids? Three minutes. When's the last time you prayed for your church? Three minutes. When's the last time you prayed for the lost people in the 62233 for three minutes? Ouch, preach. Ouch. I get it. I'm hurting right with you. I'm preaching to you. I'm sharing with you. I'm in the same boat. I've got a challenge for you today. Two of them, actually. Number one, would you commit to doing this? And you, I want you to set your watch or your phone or whatever. How many of you for the next three days would pray three times a day? Three times a day. Three times a day. Three minutes a day for the next three days. Try it. I ain't telling you to stack them up. Well, I must have prayed three minutes throughout the day or maybe nine minutes throughout the day. Uh Uh-uh. That's cheating. Don't stack them. Do it all at one time. Three times a day for three minutes for the next three days. That's challenge number one. Here's the second challenge. Would you set out to memorize Psalm 127, verse 1? That unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor... Labor in vain. I want you to own that. I want you to know it. I want it to become a part of your spiritual DNA. Lord, unless you're doing it in my life, whatever I do, it doesn't mean squat. It means nothing. All my best efforts are in vain if you're not a part of it. What do you think that says about your marriage without Jesus? Or your relationships without Jesus? Or your mental health without Jesus? Or your sobriety without Jesus. Or your recovery without Jesus. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I've given you the challenge. Three minutes, three times a day for the next three days. Man, if you would commit to that, would you just simply raise your hand? You can put it right back down. I just want you to do something. Just say, hey, I'm going to try that. You can put them right back down. Cool. It's the majority of you, which is awesome. Anybody else want to come in the last second? Okay. All right. Here's my second challenge. How many would you commit to maybe putting Psalm 127 verse 1 maybe as the lock screen on, the lock screen on your phone? Or maybe on a three by five, put it on your mirror, your refrigerator, or whatever. Well, yeah, I can memorize that. It's kind of easy. I've already got most of it done. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Easy peasy Japanese. I got that. But some of you don't. Because here's the thing when you begin to memorize it, you're going to begin to pray it. And when you begin to pray it, you can begin to, uh, you can begin to claim it. And when you begin to claim it, it's yours. Not my rules. The promises of God are yes for you in Christ. I didn't make them up, but I'm going to take advantage of them. That's my promise from God. Lord, unless you're in it, it's going to fail. I need you. Psalm 127, verse 1. How many of you would, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. How many of you could commit to memorizing Psalm 127, verse 1 this week? Thank, oh wow. Man, some of y'all beat me up before I gave it. Praise the Lord. 
Some of you are saying, man, this sounds really good. I want, a, I want a piece of that. Good deal. You're at the right place. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Man, today, if you would like to enter into that relationship with, with the one who came to die in your place for, for your sin on Calvary. He who knew no sin was made sin for you. And what Jesus wants you to do is say, hey, believe in me, love me, and I'll save you. I'll forgive you of your sin. He already loves you. Well, Brother Mike, God don't love me. Yeah, He does. The Bible says He does. And whatever you did, Jesus paid for it on the cross. That's the facts. Man, today, if you've not given your life to Jesus, you've not asked for forgiveness, you don't know whether you'd go to heaven or hell if this was your last day on this place. Hey, Let's take care of that mess. Let's, let's take care of that. Let's settle, let's settle the account with the house. Let's go to God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. But today, if, if you maybe want to come to Jesus for the first time or recommit your faith to Him, I just invite you to pray with me. This isn't a magic prayer. This isn't voodoo words. This isn't it's, you know, something I've memorized. It's just a commitment to Jesus. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you. I can't save myself. I need you. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You died in my place for me because you love me. Forgive me of my sin. Come and live in my heart. You died for me. I'm going to live for you. Thank you, Jesus. And amen. Hey, y'all, you're here on a special day. We're going to do a... Oh, how many of y'all made that decision today for the very first time to follow Jesus? Something happened inside you today. Anybody? Anybody recommit their faith? Anybody recommit to him this morning? Anybody recommit? Okay, cool. Right on. Guys, I love you. I'm going to go back and get ready for a baptism. Carrie.